Convolution Neural Network Tutorial. My name is Richard Kirshner with the Simply Learn team. That's www.simplylearn.com. Get it certified, get ahead. Today we're going to be covering the Convolutional Neural Network Tutorial. Do you know how deep learning recognizes the objects in an image? And really, this particular neural network is how image recognition works. It's very central, one of the biggest building blocks for image recognition. It does it using convolution neural network. And we over here, we have the basic picture of a um, hummingbird. Pixels of an image fed as input. You have your input layer coming in. So it takes that graphic and puts it into the input layer. You have all your hidden layers. And then you have your output layer and your output layer. One of those is going to light up and say, oh, it's a bird. We're going to go into depth. We're going to actually go back and forth on this a number of times today. So if you're not catching all the image, um, don't worry. We're going to get into the details. So we have our input layer accepts the pixels of the image as input in the form of arrays. And you can see up here where they've actually um, labeled each block of the bird in different arrays. So we'll dive into deep as to how that looks like and how those matrices are set up. Your hidden layer carry out feature extraction by performing certain calculations and manipulation. So this is the part that kind of reorganizes that picture multiple ways until we get some data that's easy to read for the neural network. This layer uses a matrix filter and performs convolution operation to detect patterns in the image. And if you remember that convolution means to coil or to twist, so we're going to twist the data around and alter it and use that operation to detect a new pattern. There are multiple hidden layers, like convolution layer, rel u is how that is pronounced, when that's the rectified linear unit. That has to do with the activation function that's used. Pooling layer also uses multiple filters to detect edges, corners, eyes, feathers, beak, etc. And just like the term says, pooling is pooling information together. And we'll look into that a lot closer here. So if, you're, if it's a little confusing now, we'll dig in deep and try to get you uh, squared away with that. And then finally, there is a fully connected layer that identifies the object in the image. So we have these different layers coming through in the hidden layers, and they come into the final area. And that's where we have the one node or one neural network entity that lights up that says it's a bird. What's in it for you? We're going to cover an introduction to the CNN. What is convolution neural network? How CNN recognizes images? We're going to dig deeper into that and really look at the individual layers in the convolutional neural network. And finally, we do a use case implementation using the CNN. We'll begin our introduction to the CNN by introducing the pioneer of convolutional neural network, Jan LeCun. He was the director of Facebook AI Research Group built the first convolutional neural network called LENET in 1988. So these have been around for a while and have had a chance to mature over the years. It was used for character recognition tasks like reading zip code digits. Imagine processing mail and automating that process. CNN is a feed-forward neural network that is generally used to analyze visual images by producing data with a grid-like topology. A CNN is also known as a convenet. And very key to this is we are looking at images. That was what this was designed for. And you'll see the different layers as we dig in mirror some of the other. Some of them are actually now used since we're using uh, TensorFlow and Keras in our code later on. You'll see that some of those layers appear in a lot of your other neural network frameworks. Uh, but in this case, this is very central to processing images and doing so in a variety that captures multiple images and really drills down into their different features. Features. In this example here, you see uh, flowers of two varieties, orchid and a rose. I think the orchid is much more dainty and beautiful, and the rose smells quite beautiful. I have a couple rose bushes in my yard. Uh, they go into the input layer. That data is then sent to all the different nodes in the next layer, one of the hidden layers. Based on its different weights and its setup, it then comes out and gives those a new value. Those values then are uh, multiplied by their weights and go to the next hidden layer, and so on. And then you have the output layer, and one of those nodes comes out and says it's an orchid, and the other one comes out and says it's a rose, depending on how it was, well it was trained. What separates the CNN, or the convolutional neural network, from other neural networks is a convolutional operation forms the basis of any convolutional neural network. In a CNN, every image is represented in the form of arrays of pixel values. So here we have a real image of the digit 8. Uh, that then gets put onto its pixel values, represented in the form of an array. In this case, you have a two-dimensional array. And then you can see in the final in form, we transform the digit 8 into its representational form of pixels of zeros and ones. 
where the ones represent in this case the black part of the eight and the zeros represent the white background. To understand the convolution neural network or how that convolutional operation works, we're going to take a sidestep and look at matrices. In this case, we're going to simplify it. We're going to take two matrices, A and B, of one dimension. Now, kind of separate this from your thinking as we learn that you want to focus just on the matrix aspect of this. And then we'll bring that back together and see what that looks like when we put the pieces for the convolutional operation. Here we've set up two arrays. We have, uh, in this case, they're a single dimension matrix. And we have A equals 5, 3, 7, 5, 9, 7 and we have B equals 1, 2, 3. So in the convolution, as it comes in there, it's going to look at these two, and we're going to start by doing multiplying them, A times B. And so we multiply the arrays element-wise, and we get 5, 6, 6, where 5 is the 5 times 1, 6 is 3 times 2, and then the other 6 is 2 times 3. And since the two arrays aren't the same size, they're not the same setup, we're going to just truncate the first one, and we're going to look at the second array multiplied just by the first three elements of the first array. Now that's going to be a little confusing. Remember, a computer gets to repeat these processes hundreds of times. So we're not going to just forget those other numbers later on. We'll see, we'll bring those back in. And then we have the sum of the product. In this case, 5 plus 6 plus 6 equals 17. So in our A times B, our very first digit in that matrix of A times B is 17. And if you remember, I said we're not going to forget the other digits. So we now have 3, 2, 5. We move one set over, and we take 3, 2, 5, and we multiply that times B. And you'll see that uh, 3 times 1 is 3, 2 times 2 is 4, and so on and so on. We sum it up, so now we have the second digit of our A times B product in the matrix. And we continue on with that same thing, so on and so on. So then we would go from uh, 3, 7, 5 to 7, 5, 9 to 5, 9, 7. This short matrix that that we have for A, we've now covered all the different entities in A that match three different levels of B. Now, in a little bit, we're going to cover where we use this math at, this multiplying of matrices and how that works. Uh, but it's important to understand that we're going through the matrix and multiplying the different parts to it to match the smaller matrix with the larger matrix. I know a lot of people get lost at is, you know, what's going on here with these matrices? Uh, ooh, scary math. Not really that scary when you break it down. We're looking at a section of A and we're comparing it to B. So when you break that down in your mind like that, you realize, okay, so I'm, I'm just taking these two matrices and comparing them, and I'm bringing the value down into one matrix, A times B. We're reducing that information in a way that will help the computer see different aspects. Let's go ahead and flip over again back to our images. Here we are back to our images. Talking about going to the most basic two-dimensional image you can get to. Consider the following two images. The image for the symbol backslash. When you press the backslash, the above image is processed. And you can see there for the image for the forward slash is the opposite. So when we click the forward slash button, that flips. Uh, very basic. We have four pixels going in. Can't get any more basic than that. Here we have a little bit more complicated picture. We take a real image of a smiley face. Um, then we represent that in the form of black and white pixels. So if this was an image in the computer, it's black and white. And like we saw before, we convert this into the zeros and ones. So where the other one would have just been a matrix of just four dots, now we have a significantly larger image coming in. So don't worry, we're going to bring this all together here in just a little bit. Layers in convolutional neural network. When we're looking at this, we have our convolution layer. And that really is the central aspect of processing images in the convolutional neural network. That's why we have it. And then that's going to be feeding in. And you have your ReLU layer, which is, you know, as we talked about, the rectified linear unit. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The ReLU is in how it act, is how that layer is activated, is the math behind it, what makes the neurons fire. You'll see that in a lot of other neural networks. When you're using it just by itself, it's for processing smaller amounts of data, where you use the atom activation feature for large data coming in. Now, because we're processing small amounts of data in each image, the ReLU layer works great. You have your pooling layer. That's where you're pooling the data together. Pooling is a neural network term. It's very commonly used. I like to use the term reduce. So if you're coming from the map and reduce side, you'll see that we're mapping all this data through all these networks, and then we're going to reduce it. We're going to pull it together. And then finally, we have the fully connected layer. That's where our output's going to come out. 
So we have started to look at matrices. We've started to look at the convolutional layer and where it fits in and everything. We've taken a look at images. So we're going to focus more on the convolution layer since this is a convolutional neural network. A convolution layer has a number of filters and perform convolution operation. Every image is considered as a matrix of pixel values. Consider the following 5x5 five five image whose pixel values are only 0 and 1. Now obviously when we're dealing with color, there's all kinds of things that come in on color processing. But we want to keep it simple and just keep it black and white. And so we have our image pixels. Uh, so we're sliding the filter matrix over the image and computing the dot product to detect the patterns. And right here, you're going to ask, where does this filter come from? This is a bit confusing because the filter is going to be derived uh, later on. We build the filters when we program or train our model. So you don't need to worry what the filter actually is, but you do need to understand how a convolution layer works is what is the filter doing? Filter, and you'll have many filters. You don't have just one filter. You'll have lots of filters that are going to look for different aspects. And so the filter might be looking for just edges. It might be looking for different parts. We'll cover that a little bit more detail in a minute. Right now, we're just focusing on how the filter works as a matrix. Remember earlier we talked about multiplying matrices together? And here we have our two-dimensional matrix. And you can see we take the filter and we multiply it in the upper left image. And you can see right here 1 times 1, 1 times 0, 1 times 1. We multiply those all together, then sum them, and we end up with a convolved feature of 4. We're going to take that and sliding the filter matrix over the image and computing the dot product to detect patterns. So we're just going to slide this over. We're going to predict the first one and slide it over one notch, predict the second one, and so on, and so on, all the way through until we have a new matrix. And this matrix, which is the same size as the filter, has reduced the image and whatever filter, whatever that's filtering out, it's going to be looking at just those features reduced down to a smaller uh, matrix. So once the feature maps are extracted, the next step is to move them to the ReLU layer. So the ReLU layer, the next step, first is going to perform an element-wise operation. So each of those maps coming in, if there's negative pixels, so it sets all the negative pixels to zero. Um, and you can see this nice graph where it just zeroes out the negatives and then you have a value that goes from zero up to whatever value is um, coming out of the matrix. This introduces nonlinearity to the network. Uh, so up until now, we have a, we say linearity. We're talking about the fact that the feature has a value. So it's a linear feature. This feature um, came up and has, let's say the feature is the edge of the beak. You know, it's like, or the backslash that we saw. Um, it'll look at that and say, okay, this feature has a value from negative 10 to 10 in this case. Um, if it was 1, it'd say, yeah, this might be a beak. It might not. It might be an edge right there. A minus 5 means, no, we're not even going to look at it. It's a 0. And so we end up with an output, and the output takes all these features, all these filtered features. Remember, we're not just running one filter on this. We're running a number of filters on this image. And so we end up with a rectified feature map that is looking at just the features coming through and how they weigh in from our filters. So here we have an input of a, it looks like a toucan bird. <laughs> Very exotic looking. Real image is scanned in multiple convolution and the ReLU layers for locating features. And you can see up here is turn it into a black and white image. And in this case, we're looking in the upper right hand corner for a feature. And that box scans over. A lot of times it doesn't scan one pixel at a time. A lot of times it will skip by two or three or four pixels uh, to speed up the process. That's one of the ways you can compensate if you don't have enough resources on your computation for large images. And it's not just one filter it slowly goes across the image. Uh, you have multiple filters that have been programmed in there. So you're looking at a lot of different filters going over the different aspects of the image and just sliding across there and forming a new matrix. One more aspect to note about the ReLU layer is we're not just having one ReLU coming in. Uh, so not only do we have multiple features going through, but we're generating multiple ReLU layers for locating the features. That's very important to note. You know, so we have a, a quite a bundle. We have multiple filters, multiple ReLU, uh, which brings us to the next step, forward propagation. Now we're going to look at the pooling layer. The rectified feature map now goes through a pooling layer. Pooling is a downsampling operation that reduces the dimensionality of the feature map. That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to take a huge amount of information and reduce it down to a single answer. This is a specific kind of bird. This is an iris. This is a rose. So you have a rectified feature map. 
And you see here we have our rectified feature map coming in. Um, we set the max pooling with a 2x2 two two filters and a stride of 2. And if you remember correctly, I talked about not going one pixel at a time. Uh, well, that's where the stride comes in. We end up with a 2x2 two two pooled feature map, but instead of moving one over each time and looking at every possible combination, we skip a, we skip a few there. We go by 2. We skip every other pixel. We just do every other one. Um, and this reduces our rectified feature map, which as you can see over here, 16 by 16 to a 4 by 4. So we're continually trying to filter and reduce our data so that we can get to something we can manage. And over here you see that we have the max uh, 3, 4, 1, and 2. And in the max pooling, we're looking for the max value, a little bit different than what we were looking at before. So coming from the rectified feature, we're now finding the max value and then we're pooling those features together. So instead of thinking of this as image of the map, think of this as how valuable is a feature in that area? How much of a feature value do we have? And we just want to find the best or the maximum feature for that area. They might have that one piece of the filter of the beak said, oh, I see a one in this beak in this image. And then it skips over and says, I see a three in this image. And it says, oh, this one is rated as a four. We don't want to sum it together because then, you know, you might have like five ones and I'll say ah five but you might have uh, four zeros and one ten and that ten says well this is definitely a beak where the ones will say probably not a beak a little strange analogy since we're looking at a bird but you can see how that pulled feature map comes down and we're just looking for the max value in each one of those matrices pooling layer uses different filters to identify different parts of the image like edges corners body feathers eyes beak, etc. Um, I know I focus mainly on the beak, but obviously uh, each feature could be each, a different part of the uh, bird coming in. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Structure of a convolution neural network so far. This is where we're at right now. We have our input image coming in, and then we use our uh, filters, and there's multiple filters on there that are being developed, to kind of twist and change that data, and so we multiply the matrices. We take that little filter, maybe it's a two by two, we multiply it by each piece of the image. And if we step two, then it's every other piece of the image. That generates multiple convolution layers. So we have a number of convolution layers we have um, set up in there just looking at that data. We then take those convolution layers, we run them through the ReLU setup, and then once we've done through the ReLU setup, and we have multiple ReLUs going on, multiple layers that are ReLU, then we're going to take those multiple layers and we're going to be pooling them. So now we have the pooling layers or multiple poolings going on. Up until this point, we're dealing with, uh, sometimes it's multiple dimensions. You can have three dimensions, some strange data setups that aren't doing images, but looking at other things, they can have four, five, six, seven dimensions. Uh, so right now, we're looking at 2D image dimensions coming in into the pooling layer. So the next step is we want to reduce those dimensions or flatten them. So flattening. Flattening is a process of converting all of the resultant two-dimensional arrays from pooled feature map into a single long continuous linear vector. So over here you see where we have a pooled feature map. Maybe that's the bird wing and it has values 6847 and we want to just flatten this out and turn it into 6847 or a single linear vector. And we find out that not only do we do each of the pooled feature maps, we do all of them into one long linear vector. So now we've gone through our convolutional neural network part, and we have the input layer into the next setup. All we've done is taken all those different pooling layers, and we've flattened them out and combined them into a single linear vector going in. So after we've done the flattening, we have uh, just a quick recap because we've covered so much, so it's important to go back and take a look at each of the steps we've gone through. The structure of the network so far is we have our convolution where we twist it and we filter it and multiply the matrices. We end up with our convolutional layer, which uses the ReLU to figure out the values going out into the pooling. As you have numerous convolution layers that then create numerous pooling layers, pooling that data together, which is the max value, which one we want to send forward. We want to send the best value. And then we're going to take all of that from each of the pooling layers and we're going to flatten it. And we're going to combine them into a single input going into the final layer. Once you get to that step, you might be looking at that going, boy, that looks like the normal input to most neural network. And you're correct, it is.
So once we have the flattened matrix from the pooling layer, that becomes our input. So the pooling layer is fed as an input to the fully connected layer to classify the image. And so you can see as our flattened matrix comes in, in this case we have the pixels from the flattened matrix fed as an input back to our uh, toucan or whatever that kind of bird that is. Um, I need one of these to identify what kind of bird that is. It comes into our forward propagation network. Uh, and that will then have the different weights coming down across. And then finally it selects that that's a bird and that it's not a dog or a cat in this case. Even though it's not labeled, the final layer there in red is our output layer. Our final output layer that says bird, cat, or dog. So quick recap of everything we've covered so far. We have our input image, which is twisted and multiplied. The filters are multiplied times the uh, matrix. The two matrices multiplied all the filters to create our convolution layer. Our convolution layers, there's multiple layers in there because it's all building multiple layers off the different filters. Then goes through the ReLU as is activation, and that creates our pooling. And so once we get into the pooling layer, we then in the pooling look for who's the best, what's the max value coming in from our convolution. And then we take that layer and we flatten it. And then it goes into a fully connected layer, our fully connected neural network, and then to the output. And here we can see the entire process, how the CNN recognizes a bird. This is kind of nice because they're showing the little pixels and where they're going. You can see the filter is generating this convolution network, and that filter shows up in the bottom part of the convolution network. And then based on that, it uses the ReLU for the pooling. The pooling then find out which one's the best, and so on, all the way to the fully connected layer at the end, or the classification in the output layer. So that'd be a classification neural network at the end. So we covered a lot of theory up till now. And you can imagine each one of these steps has to be broken down in code. So putting that together can be a little complicated. Not that each step of the process is overly complicated, but because we have so many steps. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five different steps going on here with sub-steps in there. We're going to break that down and walk through that in code. So in our use case implementation using the CNN, we'll be using the CIFAR-10 data set from Canadian Institute for Advanced Research for classifying images across 10 categories. Unfortunately, they don't let me know whether it's going to be a toucan or some other kind of bird. But we do get to find out whether it can categorize between a ship, a frog, deer, bird, airplane, automobile, cat, dog, horse, truck. So that's a lot of fun. And if you're looking at anything in the news at all of our automated cars and everything else, you can see where this kind of processing is so important in today's world and very cutting edge. As far as what's coming out in the commercial deployment, I mean, this is really cool stuff. We're starting to see this just about everywhere in industry. Uh, so great time to be playing with this and figuring it all out. Let's go ahead and dive into the code and see what that looks like when we're actually writing our script. Before we go on, let's do uh, one more quick look at what we have here. Let's just take a look at data batch one keys. And remember, in Jupyter Notebook, I can get by with not doing the print statement. If I put a variable down there, it'll just display the variable. And you can see in our data batch one for the keys, since this is a dictionary, we have the batch one label, data, and file names. Uh, so you can actually see how it's broken up in our data set. So for the next step, or step four as we're calling it, uh, we want to display the images using matplot library. There's many ways to display the images. You can even, uh, well, there's other ways to drill into it. But matplot library is really good for this. And uh, we'll also look at our first reshape uh, setup or shaping the data. So you can have a little glimpse into what that means. Uh, so we're going to start by importing our matplot. And of course, since I am doing Jupyter Notebook, I need to do the matplot inline command. So it shows up on my page. So here we go. We're going to import matplotlibrary.pyplot as plt. And if you remember matplot library, the pyplot is like a canvas that we paint stuff onto. And there's my percentage sign matplot library in line. So it's going to show up in my notebook. And then, of course, we're going to import numpy as np for our numbers python array setup. And let's go ahead and set um, x equals to data batch 1. So this will pull in all the data going into the x value. And then because this is just a long stream of binary data, uh, we need to go a little bit of reshaping. So in here we have to go ahead and reshape the data. We have 10,000 images. Okay, that looks correct. And this is kind of an interesting thing. It took me a little bit to, I had to go research this myself to figure out what's going on with this data. And what it is, is it's a 32 by 32 picture. 
And let me do this. Let me go ahead and do a drawing pad on here. Uh, so we have 32 bits by 32 bits, and it's in color. So there's three bits of color. Now, I don't know why the data is particularly like this. It probably has to do with how they originally encoded it. But most pictures put the three afterward. So what we're doing here is we're going to take uh, the shape. We're going to take the data, which is just a long stream of information. And we're going to break it up into 10,000 pieces. And those 10,000 pieces then are broken into three pieces each. And those three pieces then are 32 by 32. You could look at this like an old-fashioned projector where they have the red screen or the red projector, the blue projector, and the green projector. And they add them all together. And each one of those is a 32 by 32 bit. So that's probably how this was originally formatted was in that kind of ideal. Things have changed. So we're going to transpose it and we're going to take the three, which was here, and we're going to put it at the end. So the first part is reshaping the data from a single line of bit data, or whatever format it is, into 10,000 by 3 by 32 by 32. And then we're going to transpose the color factor to the last place. So it's the image, then the 32 by 32 in the middle. That's this part right here. And then finally, we're going to take this, uh, which is three bits of data, and put it at the end. So it's more like we do we process images now. And then as type, this is really important that we're going to use an in integer 8. You can come in here, and you'll see a lot of these. They'll try to do this with a float or a float 64. What you got to remember, though, is a float uses a lot of memory. So once you switch this into uh, something that's not integer 8, which is, goes up to 128, you are just going to, the, the amount of RAM, let me just put that in here, is going to go way up, the amount of RAM that it loads. Uh, so you want to go ahead and use this. You can try the other ones and see what happens if you have a lot of RAM on your computer. But for this exercise, this will work just fine. And let's go ahead and take that and run this. So now our X variable is all loaded and it has all the images in it from the batch one, data batch one. And just to show what we were talking about with the as type on there, if we go ahead and take X zero and just look for its max value, let me go ahead and run that. Uh, you'll see it doesn't, oops, I said 128, it's 255. Uh, you'll see it doesn't go over 255 because it's an, basically an ASCII character is what we're keeping that down to. We're keeping those values down. So they're only 255, 0 to 255 versus a uh, float value, which would bring this up um, exponentially in size. And since we're using the matplot library, we can do, um, oops, that's not what I wanted. <laughs> since we're using the matplot library, we can take our canvas and just do a plt. Dot I am for image show, and uh, let's just take a look at what X0 looks like. And it uh, comes in, I'm not sure what that is, but you can see it's a very low grade image uh, broken down to the minimal pixels on there. And if we did the same thing, oh, let's do, uh, let's see what one looks like. Hopefully it's a little easier to see. Run on there, not enter. Let's hit the run on that. Uh, and we can see this is probably a semi truck. That's a good guess on there. And I can just go back up here instead of typing the same line in over and over. And we'll look at three. Uh, that looks like a dump truck unloading. Uh, and so on. You can do any of the 10,000 images. We can just jump to 55. Uh, looks like some kind of animal looking at us there. Probably a dog. And just for fun, let's do just one more uh, uh, run on there. And we can see a nice car for our image number four. Uh, so you can see we paste through all the different images. And it's very easy to look at them. And they've been reshaped to fit our view and what the... Uh, matplot library uses for its format. So the next step is we're going to start creating some helper functions. We'll start by a one-hot encoder to help us when we're processing the data. Remember that your labels, they can't just be words. They have to switch it and we use the one-hot encoder to do that. And then we'll also create a uh, class uh, CFAR helper. So it's going to have an init and a setup for the images. And then finally, we'll go ahead and run that code. So you can see what that looks like. And then we get into the fun part where we're actually going to start creating our model, our actual neural network model. So let's start by creating our one hot encoder. We're going to create our own here. Uh, and it's going to return an out. And we'll have our vector coming in and our value is equal 10. What this means is that we have the 10 values, the 10 possible labels. And remember, we don't look at the labels as a number, because a car isn't one more than a horse. <laughs> That'd be just kind of bizarre to have horse equals zero, car equals one, plane equals two, cat equals three. So a cat plus a car equals what? Uh, so instead, we create a numpy array of zeros. And there's going to be 10 values. So we have a 10 different values in there. So you have 
uh, zero or one. One means it's a cat, zero means it's not a cat. Um, in the next line it might be that uh, one means it's a car, zero means it's not a car. So instead of having one output with a value of zero to ten, you have ten outputs with the values of zero to one. That's what the one hot encoder is doing here. And we're going to utilize this in code in just a minute. So let's go ahead and take a look at the next helpers. We have a, a few of these helper functions we're going to build. And when you're working with a very complicated Python project, dividing it up into separate definitions and classes is very important. Otherwise, it just becomes really ungainly to work with. So let's go ahead and put in our next helper, uh, which is a class. And this is a lot in this class, so we'll, we'll break it down here. And let's just start, uh, oops, we can put a space right in there. There we go. Now this is a little bit more readable. I had a second space. So we're going to create our class, the Cypher Helper. And we'll start by initializing it. Now there's a lot going on in here. So let's start with the uh, init part. Uh, Self.i equals zero. That'll come in in a little bit. We'll come back to that in the lower part. We want to initialize our training batches. So when we went through this, there was like a meta batch. We don't need the meta batch, but we do need the data batch one, two, three, four, five. And we do not want the testing batch in here. This is just the self all train batches. So we're going to come make an array of, of all those different images. And then of course we left the test batch out. So we have our self dot test batch. Uh, we're going to initialize the training images and the training labels and also the test images and the test labels. So these are just, this is just to initialize these variables in here. Then we create another definition down here, and this is going to set up the images. And let's just take a look and see what's going on in there. Now we could have all just put this as part of the uh, init part, uh, since this is all just helper stuff, but breaking it up again makes it easier to read. It also makes it easier when we start executing the different pieces to see what's going on. So that way we have a nice print statement to say, hey, we're now running this and this is what's going on in here. We're going to set up the self-training images at this point, and that's going to go to a numpy array vstack. And in there we're going to load up, uh, in this case, the data for D and self all train batches. Again, that points right up to here. So we're going to go through each one of these uh, files, or each one of these data sets, because they're not a file anymore. We've brought them in. Data batch 1 points to the actual data. And so our self-training images is going to stack them all into, our, into a numpy array. And then it's always nice to uh, get the training length. And that's just a total number of uh, self-training images in there. And then we're going to take the self-training images. And let me switch marker colors, because I am getting a little too much on the markers up here. Oops, there we go. Bring down our marker change so we can see it a little better. And at this point, this should look familiar. Where did we see this? Well, when we wanted to uh, uh, look at this above and we wanted to look at the images in the matplot library, we had to reshape it. So we're doing the same thing here. We're taking our self-training images and uh, based on the training length, total number of images, because we stacked them all together, so now it's just one large file of images, we're going to take and uh, look at it as our, our three video cameras that are each displaying uh, 32 by 32. We're going to switch that around so that now we have um, each of our images that stays the same place. And then we have our 32 by 32 and then by our three our last, uh, our three different values for the color. And of course, we want to go ahead and uh, they run this where you say divide by 255. That was from earlier. It just brings all the data into zero to one. That's what this is doing. So we're turning this into a zero to one array, which is uh, all the pictures, 32 by 32 by three. And then we're going to take the self-training labels and we're going to pump those through our one hot encoder we just made and we're going to stack them together and uh, again we're converting this into an array that goes from uh, instead of having horse equals one dog equals two and then horse plus dog would equal three which would be cat <laughs> now it's going to be uh, you know uh, an array of ten where each one is zero to one then we want to go ahead and set up our test images and labels and uh, when we're doing this, you're going to see it's the same thing we just did with the rest of them. Let me just change colors right here. This is no different than what we were doing up here with our training set. Uh, we're going to stack the different uh, images. Uh, we're going to get the length of them so we know how many images are in there. Uh, you certainly could add them by hand, but it's nice to let the computer do it, especially if it ever changes on the other end and you're using other data. And again, we reshape them and transpose them, and we also do the one hot encoder. Same thing we just did on our training images. So now our test images are in the same format. 
So now we have a uh, definition which sets up all our images in there. And then the next step is to go ahead and batch them, or next batch. And let's do another breakout here for batches, because this is really important to understand. It tends to throw me for a little loop when I'm working with TensorFlow or Keras or a lot of these. We have our data coming in. If you remember, we had like 10,000 photos. Let me just put 10,000 down here. We don't want to run all 10,000 at once. So we want to break this up into batch sizes. And you also remember that we had the number of photos, in this case, uh, length of test or whatever number is in there. Uh, we also have 32 by 32 by 3. So when we're looking at the batch size, we want to change this from 10,000 to um, a batch of, in this case, I think we're going to do batches of 100. So we want to look at just 100, the first 100 of the photos. And if you remember, we set self i equal to zero. Uh, so what we're looking at here is we're going to create x. We're going to get the next batch from the very initialized. We've already initialized it for zero. So we're going to look at x from zero to batch size, which we've set to 100. So just the first 100 images. And then we're going to reshape that into, uh, and this is important to let the data know, that we're looking at 100 by 32 by 32 by 3. Now, we've already formatted it to the 32 by 32 by 3. This just sets everything up correctly so that X has the data in there in the correct order and the correct shape. And then the Y, just like the X, uh, is our labels. So our training labels, again, they go from 0 to batch size. In this case, they do self I plus batch size because the self I is going to keep changing. And then finally, we increment the self I because we have 0. So, we, so the next time we call it, we're going to get the next batch size. And so basically, we have X and Y. X being the photograph data coming in and Y being the label. And that, of course, is labeled through one hot encoder. So if you remember correctly, if it was, say, uh, horse is equal to zero, it would be um, uh, one for the zero position, since this is the horse, and then everything else would be zero in here. Let me just put lines through there. There we go. There's our array. <laughs> Hard to see that array. So let's go ahead and take that, and uh, we're going to finish loading it, since this is our class. And now we're armed with all this, um, uh, our setup over here. Let's go ahead and load that up. And so we're going to create a variable ch with the CFAR helper in it. And then we're going to do ch.setupimages. Uh, now we could have just put all of the setup images under the init, but by breaking this up into two parts, it makes it much more readable. And um, also, if you're doing other work, there's reasons to do that as far as the setup. Let's go ahead and run that. And you can see where it says uh, setting up training images and labels, setting up test images. And that's one of the reasons we broke it up is so that if you're testing this out, you can actually have print statements in there telling you what's going on, which is really nice. Uh, they did a good job with this setup. I like the way that it was broken up in the back. And then one quick note, you want to remember that batch, to set up the next batch, since we have to run uh, batch equals ch next batch, of 100 because we're going to use the 100 size. Uh, but we'll come back to that. We're going to use that. Just remember that that's part of our code we're going to be using in a minute from the definition we just made. So now we're ready to create our model. First thing we want to do is we want to import our TensorFlow as TF. I'll just go ahead and run that so it's loaded up. And uh, you can see we got a, a warning here. Uh, that's because they're making some changes. It's always growing and they're going to be depreciating one of the uh, values from float64 to float type or is treated as an NP float64. Uh, nothing to really worry about because this doesn't even affect what we're working on because we've set all of our stuff to a 255 value or 0 to 1. And do keep in mind that 0 to 1 value that we converted to 255 is still a float value, uh, but it'll easily work with either the uh, numpy float 64 or the numpy D type float. It doesn't matter which one it goes through, so the depreciation would not affect our code as we have it. And in our TensorFlow, uh, we'll go ahead, let me just increase the size in there just a moment so you can get better view of the, um, what we're typing in. Uh, we're going to set a couple placeholders here. And so we have, we're going to set x equals tf placeholder tf float 32. We just talked about the float 64 versus the numpy float. We're actually just going to keep this at float 32. More than a uh, significant number of decimals for what we're working with. And since it's a placeholder, we're going to set the shape equal to, and we've set it equal to none. Because at this point, we're just hold, holding the place on there. We'll be setting up as we run the batches. That's what the first value is. And then 32 by 32 by 3, that's what we reshaped our data to fit in. And then we have our y true equals placeholder tf float 32. And the shape equals none comma 10. 10 is the 10 different labels we have. So it's an array of 10. 
And then let's create one more placeholder. We'll call this a uh, hold prob or hold probability. And we're going to use this. We don't have to have a shape or anything for this. This placeholder is for what we call dropout. If you remember from our theory before, we drop out so many nodes is looking at or the different values going through, which helps decrease bias. So we need to go ahead and put a a placeholder for that also. And we'll run this so it's all loaded up in there. So we have our three different placeholders. And since we're in TensorFlow, when you use Keras, it does some of this automatically, but we're in TensorFlow Direct. Keras sits on TensorFlow. We're going to go ahead and create some more helper functions. We're going to create something to help us initialize the weights, uh, initialize our bias. If you remember that each uh, layer has to have a bias going in. We're going to go ahead and work on our, our conversional 2D, our max pool. So we have our pooling layer, our convolutional layer, and then our normal full layer. So we're going to go ahead and put those all into definitions. And let's see what that looks like in code. And you can also grab some of these helper functions from the MNIST, the uh, NIST setup. We just put that in there if you're under the TensorFlow. So a lot of these are already in there, but we're going to go ahead and do our own. And we're going to create our uh, init weights. And there, one of the reasons we're doing this is so that you can actually start thinking about what's going on in the back end. So even though there's ways to do this with an automation, sometimes these have to be tweaked and you have to put in your own setup in here. Uh, now we're not going to be doing that. We're just going to recreate them for our code. And let's take a look at this. We have our weights. And so what comes in is going to be the shape. And what comes out is going to be uh, random numbers. So we're going to go ahead and just init some random numbers based on the shape with a standard deviation of 0.1. Kind of a fun way to do that. And then the TF variable uh, init random distribution. So we're just creating a random distribution on there. That's all that is for the weights. Now, you might change that. You might have a, a higher standard deviation. In some cases, you actually load preset weights. That's pretty rare. Usually, you're testing that against another model or something like that, and you want to see how those weights configure with each other. Uh, now, remember, we have our bias. So we need to go ahead and initialize the bias with a constant. Uh, in this case, we're using 0.1. A lot of times, the bias is just put in as 1, and then you have your weights to add on to that. Uh, but we're going to set this as 0.1. Uh, so we want to return a convolutional 2D, in this case, a neural network. This is uh, would be a layer on here. What's going on with the con 2D? Is we're taking our data coming in, uh, we're going to filter it. Strides, if you remember correctly, strides came from, here's our image, and then we only look at this picture here, and then maybe we have a stride of one, so we look at this picture here, and we continue to look at the different filters going on there. The other thing this does is that we have our data coming in as 32 by 32 by 3. And we want to change this so that it's just, this is three dimensions, and it's going to reformat this as just two dimensions. So it's going to take this number here and combine it with the 32 by 32. So this is a very important layer here because it's reducing our data down using different means. And it connects down, I'm just going to jump down one here. Uh, it goes with the convolutional layer. So you have your, your kind of your pre-formatting and the setup, and then you have your actual convolution layer that goes through on there. And you can see here we have init weights by the shape, init bias, shape of three, because we have the three different, uh, here's our three again. And then we return the TFNN ReLU with the convention 2D. So this convolutional uh, has this feeding into it right there. It's using that as part of it. And of course the input is the x, y plus b, the bias. So that's quite a mouthful, but these two are the are the keys here to creating the convolutional layers there. The convolutional 2D coming in, and then the convolutional layer, which then steps through and creates all those filters we saw. Then of course we have our pooling. Uh, so after each time we run it through the convectional layer, we want to pool the data. Uh, if you remember correctly on the on the pool side, and let me just get rid of all my marks. It's getting a little crazy there. And in fact, let's go ahead and jump back to that slide. Let's just take a look at that slide over here. Uh, so we have our image coming in. We create our convolutional layer with all the filters. Remember the filters go, um, you know, the filters coming in here and it looks at these four boxes. And then if it's a step, let's say step two, it then goes to these four boxes and then the next step and so on. Uh, so we have our convolutional layer that we generate or convolutional layers. They use the uh, ReLU function. Um, there's other functions out there. For this though, the ReLU is the uh, most the, the one that works the best, at least so far. I'm sure that will change. And then we have our pooling. Now, if you remember correctly, the pooling was max. Uh, so if we had the filter coming in, and they did the multiplication on there, and we have a 1, and maybe a 2 here, and another 1 here, and a 3 here, 3 is the max. 
And so out of all of these, you then create an array that would be three, and if the max is over here, two, or whatever it is. That's what goes into the pooling of what's going on in our pooling. Uh, so again, we're reducing that data down. We're reducing it down as, as small as we can. And then finally, we're going to flatten it out into a single array, and that goes into our fully connected layer. And you can see that here in the code. Right here, we're going to create our normal full layer. Um, so at some point, we're going to take from our pooling layer. This will go into some kind of flattening process. And then that will be fed into the full, the different layers going in down here. Um, and so we have our input size. You'll see our input layer get shape, which is just going to get the shape for whatever's coming in. Uh, and then input size, initial weights is also based on uh, the input layer coming in. And the input size down here is based on the input layer shape. So we're just going to already use the shape and already have our size coming in. And of course, uh, you have to make sure you init the bias. Always put your bias on there. And we'll do that based on the size. So this will return tf.matmul input layer w plus b this is just a normal full layer that's what this means right down here that's what we're going to return so that was a lot of steps we went through let's go ahead and run that so those are all loaded in there and let's go ahead and uh, create the layers let's see what that looks like now that we've done all the heavy lifting and everything uh, we get to do all the easy part let's go ahead and create our layers We'll create a convolution layer one and two, two different convolutional layers. And then we'll take that and we'll flatten that out. We'll create a, a reshape pooling in there for our reshape. And then we'll have our full uh, layer at the end. So let's start by creating our first uh, convolutional layer. And then we come in here and let me just run that real quick. And I want you to notice on here the three and the 32. This is important because coming into this convolutional layer we have three different channels and 32 pixels each. Uh, so that has to be in there. The 4 and 4 you can play with. This is your filter size. So if you remember you have a filter and you have your image and the filter slowly steps over and filters out this image depending on what your step is. For this particular setup 4, 4 is just fine. That should work pretty good for what we're doing and for the size of the image. And then, of course, at the end, once you have your convolutional layer set up, you also need to pool it. And you'll see that the pooling is automatically set up so that it would see the different shape based on what's coming in. So here we have max 2x2, two by, two by two, and we put in the convolutional one that we just created, the convolutional layer we just created goes right back into it. And that right up here, as you can see, is the X. It's coming in from here, so it knows to look at the first model and set the the data accordingly set that up uh, so it matches and we went ahead and ran this already i think i ran it let me go ahead and run it again and if we're going to do one layer let's go ahead and do a second layer down here and it's uh, we'll call it convo 2 <laughs> it's also a convolutional layer on this and you'll see that we're feeding convolutional 1 in the pooling so it goes from convolutional 1 into convolutional 1 pooling from convolutional 1 pooling into convolutional 2, and then from convolutional 2 into convolutional 2 pooling. And we'll go ahead and take this and run this. So these variables are all loaded into memory. And for our flattened layer, uh, let's go ahead and we'll do, uh, since we have 64 coming out of here and we have uh, 4 by 4 going in, let's do 8 by 8 by 64. So let's do 4096. This is going to be the flat layer. So that's how many bits are coming through on the flat layer. And we'll reshape this. So we'll reshape our uh, uh, Convo 2 pooling and that will feed into here, the Convo 2 pooling. And then we're going to set it up as a single layer that's 4096 in size. That's what that means there. We'll go ahead and run this. So we've now created this variable, the convo2 flat. And then we have our first full layer. This is the final uh, neural network where we have the flat layer going in. And we're going to again use the uh, ReLU for our uh, setup on there on a neural network for evaluation. And you'll notice that we're going to create our first full layer. Our normal full layer, that's our definition. So we created that. That's creating the normal full layer. And our input for the data comes right here from the, this goes right into it, uh, the Convo2 flat. So this tells it how big the data is. And we're going to have it come out. It's going to have uh, 1024. That's how big the layer is coming out. We'll go ahead and run this. So we, now we have our full layer 1. And with the full layer 1, we want to also define the full 1 dropout to go with that. 
So our full layer one comes in, uh, keep probability equals hold probability. Remember we created that earlier. And the full layer one is what's coming into it. And this is going backwards and training the data. We're not training every weight. We're only training a percentage of them each time, which helps get rid of the bias. So let me go ahead and run that. And uh, finally, we'll go ahead and create a Y predict, which is going to equal the normal full one dropout and 10, because we have 10 labels in there. Now, in this neural network, we could have added additional layers. That would be another option to play with. You can also play with, instead of 1024, you can use other numbers for the way that sets up and what's coming out and going into the next one. We're only going to do just the one layer and the one layer dropout. And you can see, if we did another layer, it'd be real easy just to feed in the full one dropout into full layer two. And then full layer two dropout would have full layer two feed into it. And then you'd switch that here for the Y prediction. For right now, this is great. This particular data set is tried and true, and we know that this will work on it. And if we just type in Y predict, and we run that, uh, we'll see that this is a tensor object, uh, shape question mark 10, D type 32. A quick way to double check what we're working on. So now we've got all of our, uh, we've done a setup all the way to the Y predict, which we just did. Uh, we want to go ahead and apply the loss function and make sure that's set up in there. Uh, create the optimizer and then uh, train our optimizer and create a variable to initialize all the global TF variables. So before we dive into the um, loss function, let me point out one quick thing, or just kind of a rehab over a couple things. And that is, when we're playing with this, these setups, um, we pointed out up here we can change the 4-4 and use different numbers there. They change your outcome. So depending on what numbers you use here will have a huge impact on how well your model fits. And that's the same here with the 1024 also. This is also another number that if you continue to raise that number, you'll get um, possibly a better fit. You might overfit. And if you lower that number, you'll use less resources. And generally, you want to use this in um, the exponential growth. An exponential being 2, 4, 8, 16. And in this case, the next one down would be 5, 12. You can use any number there, but those would be the ideal numbers uh, when you look at this data. So the next step in all this is we need to also create uh, a way of tracking how good our model is. And we're going to call this a loss function. And so we're going to create a cross entropy loss function. And so before we discuss exactly what that is, let's take a look and see what we're feeding it. Uh, we're going to feed it our labels, and we have our true labels and our prediction labels. Uh, so coming in here is where the two different uh, variables we're sending in, or the two different probability distributions, is one that we know is true and what we think it's going to be. Now this function right here, when they talk about cross entropy, uh, in information theory, the cross entropy between two probability distributions over the same underlying set of events measures the average number of bits needed to identify an event drawn from the set. That's a mouthful. Uh, really, we're just looking at the amount of error in here. How many of these are correct and how many of these um, are incorrect? So how much of it matches? And we're going to look at that. We're just going to look at the average. That's what the mean, the reduced to the mean means here. So we're looking at the average error on this. And so the next step is we're going to take the error. We want to know uh, our cross entropy or our loss function, how much loss we have. That's going to be part of how we train the model. So when you know what the loss is and we're training it, we feed that back into the back propagation setup. And so we want to go ahead and optimize that. Here's our optimizer. We're going to create the optimizer using an atom optimizer. Remember, there's a lot of different ways of optimizing the data. Atom's the most popular used. Uh, so our optimizer is going to equal the TF train atom optimizer. If you don't remember what the learning rate is, let me just pop this back into here. Here's our learning rate. When you have your weights, you have all your weights and your different nodes that are coming out. Here's our node coming out, um, and it has all its weights. And then the error is being prop sent back through in reverse on our neural network. So we take this error and we adjust these weights based on the different formulas. In this case, the atom formula is what we're using. We don't want to just adjust them completely. We don't want to change this weight so it exactly fits the data coming through. Because if we made that kind of adjustment, it's going to be biased to whatever the last data we sent through is. Instead, we're going to multiply that by 0.001 and make a very small shift in this weight. So our delta W is only 0.001 of the actual delta W of the full change we're going to compute from the atom. 
And then we want to go ahead and train it. So our training or set up a training uh, uh, variable or function. And this is going to equal our optimizer minimize cross entropy. And we make sure we go ahead and run this. So it's loaded in there. And then we're almost ready to train our model. But before we do that, we need to create one more um, variable in here. And we're going to create a variable to initialize all the global TF variables. And when we look at this, um, the TF global variable initializer, this is a TensorFlow um, object, it goes through there and it looks at all our different setup that we have going under our TensorFlow and then initializes those variables. Uh, so it's kind of like a magic wand because it's all hidden in the back end of TensorFlow. All you need to know about this is that you have to have the initialization on there, which is an operation, um, and you have to run that once you have your setup going. So we'll go ahead and run this piece of code, and then we're going to go ahead and train our data. So let me run this so it's loaded up there. And so now we're going to go ahead and run the model by creating a graph session. Graph session is a TensorFlow term. So you'll see that coming up. It's one of the things that throws me because I always think of GraphX and Spark and Graph as just general graphing. Uh, but they talk about a graph session. So we're going to go ahead and run the model. And let's go ahead and walk through this, uh, what's going on here. And let's paste this data in here. And here we go. So we're going to start off with a, with a TF session as SES. So that's our actual TF session that we've created. Uh, so we're right here with the TF uh, session. Our session we're creating, we're going to run TF global variable initializer. So right off the bat, we're initializing our variables here. Uh, and then we have for I in range 500. So what's going on here, remember 500, we're going to break the data up and we're going to batch it in at 500 points each. We've created our session run. So we're going to do with TF session as session right here. We've created our variable session. Uh, and then we're going to run and we're going to go ahead and initialize it. So we have our TF global variables initializer that we created. Um, that initializes our, our session in here. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to go for I in range of 500 batch equals ch.next batch. So if you remember correctly, this is loading up um, 100 pictures at a time. And uh, this is going to loop through that 500 times. So we are literally doing, uh, what is that? Uh, 500 times 100 is uh, 50,000. So that's 50,000 pictures we're going to process right there. And the first process is we're going to do a session run. We're going to take our train. We created our train variable or optimizer in there. We're going to feed it the dictionary. Uh, we had our feed dictionary that we created. And we have x equals batch 0 coming in, y true, batch 1 hold the probability 0.5 and then just so that we can keep track of what's going on we're going to every uh, 100 steps we're going to run a print so currently on step format accuracy is um, and we're going to look at matches equals tf dot equal tf argument y prediction one tf dot arg max y true comma one so we're going to look at this as how many matches it has and here our acc uh, all we're doing here is we're going to take the matches how many matches they have it creates it generates a chart we're going to convert that to float that's what the tf cast does and then we just want to know the average we just want to know the average of the um, accuracy and then we'll go ahead and print that out uh, print session run accuracy feed dictionary so it takes all this and it prints out our accuracy on there so let's go ahead and take this. Oops, flip screens there. Let's go ahead and take this and let's run it. And this is going to take a little bit to run. Uh, so let's see what happens on my old laptop. And we'll see here that we have our current. Uh, we're currently on step zero. It takes a little bit to get through the accuracy. And this will take just a moment to run. We can see that on our step zero, it has an accuracy of 0.1 or 0 0.1028. Um, and as it's running, we'll go ahead, uh, you don't need to watch it run all the way, but uh, this accuracy is going to change a little bit up and down. So we've actually lost some accuracy during our step two. <laughs> um, but we'll see how that comes out. Let's come back after we run it all the way through and see how the different steps come out. I was actually reading that backwards. Uh, the way this works is the closer we get to one, the more accuracy we have. Uh, so you can see here we've gone from a point one to a 0.39 um, and we'll go ahead and pause this and come back and see what happens when we're done with the uh, full run. All right, now that we've uh, prepared the meal, got it in the oven and pulled out my finished dish here, if you've ever watched uh, any of the old cooking shows, let's discuss a little bit about this accuracy going on here and how do you interpret that? We've done a couple things. 
first we've defined accuracy. Um, the reason I got it backwards before is you have uh, loss or accuracy. And with loss, you'll get a graph that looks like this. It goes, oops, that's an S, by the way. <laughs> there we go. You get a graph that curves down like this. And with accuracy, you get a graph that curves up. This is how good it's doing. Now, in this case, uh, 1 is supposed to be really good accuracy. That means it gets close to 1, but it never crosses 1. So if you have an accuracy of 1, that is phenomenal. Um, in fact, that's pretty much unpo you know, unheard of. And the same thing with loss. If you have a loss of zero, that's also unheard of. And the zero is actually on this this axis right here as we go in there. So how do we interpret that? Because, you know, if I was looking at this and I go, oh, 0.51, that's 51%. Uh, You're doing 50-50. No, this is not percentage. Let me just put that in there. It is not percentage. Uh, this is logarithmic. What that means is that 0.2 is twice as good as 0.1. And uh, when we see 0.4, that's twice as good as 0.2. Real way to convert this into a percentage. You really can't say this is, is a direct percentage conversion. What you can do, though, is in your head, if we were to give this a percentage, uh, we might look at this as 50%. Uh, we're just guessing equals 0.1. And if 50% roughly equals 0 0.1, that's where we started up here at the top. Remember at the top here, here's our 0 0.1028. The accuracy of 50%, then 75% is about 0.2, and so on and so on. Don't quote those numbers because that doesn't work that way. They say that if you have 0.95, that's pretty much saying 100%. And if you have a, anywhere between, you'd have to go look this up. Let me go ahead and remove all my drawings there. Uh, so the magic number is 0.5. We really want to be over a 0.5 in this whole thing. And we have uh, both 0 0.5004. Remember, this is accuracy. If we were looking at loss, then we'd be looking the other way. But 0.0, you know, instead of how high it is, we want how low it is. Uh, but with accuracy, being over a 0.5 is pretty valid. That means this is pretty solid. And if you get to a 0.95, then it's a direct correlation. That's what we're looking for here in these numbers. And you can see we finished with this model at 0.5135, so still good. Um, and if we look at uh, when they ran this in the other end, remember there's a lot of randomness that goes into it when we see the weights. Uh, they got 0.5251, so a little better than ours. But that's fine. You'll find your own uh, comes up a little bit better or worse depending on uh, just that randomness. And so we've gone through the whole model. We've created, we've trained the model, and we've also gone through on every uh, hundredth run to test the model to see how accurate it is. And now that we have a solid running model and an accuracy, let's go ahead and take a look at what we covered today. We did cover a lot because this is a very complicated subject. And it's not so much complicated in uh, any, any individual step. It just has a lot of steps involved. Uh, so today we covered what is a convolutional neural network. And you can see we have the pictures coming in to the input layer, uh, to the hidden layers, to the output layer, and then orchid or rows. We talked about the very basics at the beginning. And we discussed how a CNN recognizes images. And the very basics is we converted the image into a pixel map of zeros and ones. Then we dived into layers in a convolutional neural network. And we had our uh, convolutional layer, our fully convected layer, our uh, uh, ReLU layer, and our pooling layer. And uh, we looked at pooling layer. It reduces uh, the data down to a smaller amount by finding the, um, uh, first it finds the matches, and then it finds the uh, maximum value in that match. Uh, and we discussed all the different layers in there. We went into the fully connected layer, which is your normal, the neural networks you're probably used to dealing with, where we're just building a, a forward propagation neural network. And we connected them all together. And you can see here, uh, um, we took the bird, we uh, did our extracting, our feature extraction in multiple hidden layers, where we had our convolution, which then generated those little individual filters, and we had our ReLU, and then we took the ReLU, we max pooled those, and then we took all of those pooled values at the end, so they've been reduced to smaller um, mappings, we've reduced that, and then we fed that into the fully connected layer. And then finally, we went into the use case implementation using CNN, and we walked through a full demo on the coding on there. With that, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, so thank you. For more information, visit www.simplylearn.com, get certified, get ahead. You can also post questions down below in the YouTube and we'll try to answer those as best we can.
Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.